Dr. Malefi Asante, chairman of the African American Studies Department at Temple University and author of Afrocentricity. I mean, okay. That's right. Just happened to be black. Give me your comment on that. Pathetic. Because you can't be no other if you're African. You can't. There is no just happened. To be. Why, why do you think that is said? Well, you, I, you know, what, hap what happens is that you get these writers, particularly an artist, uh, who uh, once, and I've seen this a number of times, are musicians, and someone says, well, you know, you are really an outstanding um, African-American musician. And the person says, well, I just happen to be black. I'm a musician. Well, but you were black before you were a musician. Mm -hmm. You were an African-American before you were a writer before you were an artist. Your fundamental reality is, is the African reality. And all the other things that come uh, after birth, of course, are things that one acquires. I mean, but essentially, we are African people. And for an African uh, person to mm -hmm. say that is also an admission of an inferiority complex. Because it is rare that you would hear, for example, a Jewish writer say, I just happen to be Jewish. You don't do that. I mean, there's no reason for that. The only reason for that is because of a sense of inferiority, that you feel that you've got to make other people believe that I'm good. Yes, I'm good. Um, and, I'm just, and I'm universal. And I'm universal. But of uh -huh. course, uh, there are no humans apart from their culture. Uh -huh. All human beings exist with culture. And sometimes African Americans believe you can't be black and human. You are at Temple University. How would you describe the attitude that African American students have regarding African history? Well, it's probably not much different from the attitudes at other campuses, but maybe a little bit more positive and I and I'm not just talking about temper right, so much right just generally speaking uh -huh. well generally speaking I think that the attitude that African Americans have uh, toward African history students now uh, I think that the attitude is much better than I've seen it in a long time and the reason for that has been that there have been a number of informal workshops symposia seminars lectures there are tapes that are uh, uh, disseminated around the country so we're getting a student population that has been exposed to many more uh, uh, things in terms of our history than before and so I think that there's a growing consciousness and awareness the african-american students going to a predominantly african-american college with a teacher that does not try to help him get centered on African history, African culture, is doing what to him? It's betraying him. It is a, it's a shame. It's a disgrace. In fact, uh, I've, this is one of the other um, points that I have made uh, recently. It is a shame and a disgrace that African American colleges have been so slow to adopt Afrocentric positions. The student demonstration at Howard University simply indicated one thing. When those students began to demonstrate and say, we want an Afrocentric curriculum, I, I was so happy for them because I said to myself, it, they ought to have had always an Afrocentric curriculum. But the university has never adopted a position that sees African knowledge as central. It is, it is adopted a Eurocentric model. And a Eurocentric model means that African knowledge becomes peripheral knowledge, mm -hmm. when in fact it should be centered. The literature department ought to be centered on African writers, on African-American writers. European writers should be on the periphery of such a department. If you're going to make African-centered education responsive, to the demands of the 21st century. We've got to do that. The history department should have history courses that are centered first on ancient African history, modern African history, intermediate African history, African American history, Africans in the diaspora in the Caribbean and the South America. 
I mean, that should be the center of a history department in a predominantly black institution. I mean, these things really agitate me because I, when you go to a black college and they say to you, we teach Russian here, we teach Spanish here, we teach Sp French here, and you say to them, do you teach Yoruba? Do you teach Swahili? And they say, oh no, we won't have any students who would be interested in those courses. Then you, th you have to think that there is something fundamentally, profoundly wrong with predominantly black institutions. Which were established to... Well, you want to lead me into something? No, I'm right? just asking. <laughs> I'm not finished. I'm just asking questions. <laughs> Which was, was, well, These institutions well, were established well, primarily that, to... That, well, it, it, well, they were established for different reasons, of course. I mean, some were established mainly as training uh, grounds for the children of the masters uh, that they had had with slave uh, women. Uh, enslaved African women and, and, and they, those children went to certain schools. Some were established to train uh, Native Americans and African Americans in how to fit into the economy of the U.S. Um, others were started as religious schools, et cetera, et cetera. But fundamentally, what, what uh, has happened it, uh, in, in two instances, and, I, and I, I mentioned that instance particularly of what has happened in terms of the curricula of these uh, colleges and universities is that they have not turned, they, there's not one, there's not one that's Afrocentric. In other words, I wrote an article last year, or two years ago, uh, on, Afro, on the Afrocentric university which is widely disseminated in Africa because I, I, I contended that there's not one Afrocentric university in the United States or on the continent of Africa. It does not exist. Now, that's one of, of the problems. The second uh, problem is that uh, when these institutions were established, they were established essentially without, uh, w with a philanthropist not allowing them to establish uh, publishing houses or, or presses, which meant that the books that they use were not written by their professors, or if they were written, they were not published by those uh, universities. Most major universities in America have a, a presses. Uh, I think only one or maybe two of our universities or colleges uh, have uh, presses. But this is, this is incredible, because what it means is that we have not created, with 120 colleges, we have not created a broad reading public in terms of read, with 35 million people, and, 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 and if we had one million of our people reading regularly and passing books and trading books and giving books as gifts that are published by our presses, by the university presses or college presses, we would have an enormous degree of consciousness. But these universities and colleges were pre pre presented or uh, prevented from establishing these presses many times by philanthropists, but also by their own inability to see the vision. Now let us clarify. What is Afrocentricity, and what are some steps that must be taken to get us thinking and behaving Afrocentrically? Well, Afrocentricity, again, is simply when the African person begins to see the world through a frame of reference that is centered on that person's historical experiences. And if you see the world that way, if someone, for example, says to you, who is the uh, most outstanding person in American history? It would seem to me that an Afrocentric person would probably want to say, somebody like Harriet Tubman. I mean, that's, that's just coming out of your historical experiences. You, you couldn't say, you see, on the other hand, you couldn't say out of that experience that, uh, that uh, Thomas Jefferson was the greatest person in American history, if you're Afrocentric. Or, for example, if someone says, well, I mean, what about white people? Then you say, well, maybe John Brown. Because what you're doing, you are interpreting now reality from your own center. That's important. Africans have rarely done that in this country, and they have not done it simply because of the tremendous impact of the media on our consciousness. Now, how are some, what are some steps? I think there's some very practical steps. The first thing I would do if I were a person who wanted to be on this road would simply be to take the space that I'm in. If you're living in a home or in an apartment, or you uh, have a church or a mosque or 
what have you, began to Afrocentricize it in terms of motifs. Simply say, go out, you know, and say, I'm going to now uh, buy some kente cloth or some African fabrics. I'm going to Afrocentricize it. If you uh, are a book collector, say, I'm going to now start collecting also African American books and African books um, in your home demonstrate uh, an Afrocentric consciousness by purchasing the artworks of African artists. Many African American <coughs> artists, some of the greatest artists in the world, uh, live among us. And yet African Americans go and purchase 9 dollars uh, uh, reproductions of European artists for their homes. You can't, see, you, you have to begin to take a sense of consciousness. We wouldn't normally, if we, this is why we said earlier, we wouldn't normally have to deal with this question if we had not had the bombardment of 500 years of cultural dislocation. But, but white Americans, the European world, has this discussion, but in what form? Well, I mean, the, the, the discussion of... Discussion uh, in terms of how to keep themselves centered. Well, essentially what happens in the European world mm -hmm. is that all of the, uh, the, the, the dominant media, uh, educational institutions, uh, the churches, uh, camps, seminars, military academies, all of these things are arrayed in order to keep the culture reinforced. And so one almost gets it by osmosis. I mean, simply it's in the air. In other words, uh, you don't have to... Uh, uh, ask yourself who Shakespeare is. I mean, you don't even have to know anything about Shakespeare to know Shakespeare or to have heard Shakespeare's name. But to hear Langston Hughes's name, you have to do extra work. And, I'm, and for an African American, that presents sometimes a problem. But I'm just saying that those are the differences, that in a sense, the society itself uh, reinforces European culture. So there's no need necessarily to write Eurocentricity. No, because uh -huh. everything is Eurocentric. You see, the, the, the whole thing is, is that essentially, uh, to, to, this is the question like, uh, that we often have sometimes with African American studies at universities. People say, why should there be African American studies if there is not white studies? Well, everything else is white studies. Whether it's political science, called sociology, or called economic, it all is white studies. And what you are affirming are white intellectuals. In those, in those departments. And so the need is different because in a sense, the whole dominant culture, the whole uh, majority society is essentially one of reaffirming the myths out of that culture. So one knows the golden fleece and the holy grail. All of this is, is right in the movies. I mean, it comes right out of the culture. But yet, African images, the images of Shaka and Pianki and Taharka and, and Shabaka and Shabataka, uh, Zulu and uh, Zenzakona, uh, uh, Luzimani, Mzilikazi, uh, Nzinga, you see, Yaha Asantiwa, these are images that exist and occur in our historical experiences, but they are never brought to the fore. So consequently, our people don't know them. Neither do the whites know them, but the whites don't care about knowing them, you see, because they are presenting their own worldview. And they are not, of course, uh, stopping to say, oh, but there is another idea here, or there are other ideas. We must do that. S several quotes. Time is getting short. Every time an African achieves heroic stature in defense of our people, you say, Someone labels her or him a Moses. That is because of the Christian notion. The whole idea is that, that people see it uh, somehow as I call it the Messianic notion. Uh, the, the idea that somehow uh, the person who is, who, who is uh, achieving is somehow a deliverer, somehow a liberator. When in fact, that person is simply no more than a reflection of the mass of the people. That, uh, as, as Sweet Honey and the Rock used to sing uh, a song about Biko, in which they say, okay, there's Biko, but I see 10,000 Bikos arising, you see? And I think that that's what we need to begin to see, is that there are, there are 10,000 of these people. We don't have to say Moses either, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what does that do in terms of, of, of moving 
the, the African-American from that African center. This is why I say we don't have to call, him, call the person Moses. We can uh -huh. call the person Shaka. I mean, the point is that what happens is that Moses moves you off of center. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, what you are participating there in is really a Jewish culture. You, you, you identify your leaders as, uh, with Jewish history. Mm -hmm. So when you say somebody is a black Moses, and this is what you read in the literature sometimes, what you are talking, what you're really doing is you are actually disemboweling the African historical experiences, taking it out and putting that person in the form of someone else's culture. You are, you are, you are, you are simply saying that the African person cannot stand alone. And if the African person can stand alone, then you should find the examples and the motifs out of that culture, out of that history. Another quote. What kind of salad dressing do you prefer? Nigerian. What happened to French? Well, that's a Eurocentric imposition on my consciousness. And I think that what happens is that essentially, if you take food, this is why I say, you see, the Europeans use everything. Whether, it's, uh, whether it is how you name uh, foods, uh, whether it is uh, how you choose uh, place names, uh, even on Af in, in the African continent. When the Europeans went to Africa, they said, uh, okay, you may have called this uh, Harare, we're going to call it Salisbury. In other words, I'm saying that everything in our consciousness is, is, con is continually bombarded, 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 bombarded. So, th so the African assumes that French or Russian or Italian or but the names of but you're names. saying, But you're saying that it's fine for them to use it. Well, essentially, there is nothing wrong with a Eurocentric perspective for Europeans. That is natural. What the problem becomes is when Africans do not have an Afrocentric perspective and when the Europeans do not allow space for the Afrocentric perspective to be a, a, a co-perspective. This city is like a jungle, if you can remember that from your book. This city is like the steppes of Russia. Why? Explain that. Well, because I think the jungle, I mean, or forest particularly, uh, uh, quite frankly, jungle doesn't exist in Africa, but the rainforest, but people think it does. And so when they use that image, city is like a jungle, they, they, they have these images of Africa and, and the difficulties that people might have in Africa. But, but Africans live in the rainforest and it's not an inhospitable place. But in the steppes, the Eurasian steppes you were Yeah, to? sure, of course. Uh -huh. That may be inhospitable. But the European rarely uses now, what that as the, a symbol. You see what why I'm do saying? you say the steppes were, were, were... Well, because the steppes may be very difficult, cold, and, and, and unfriendly to us. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, why was the steppes uh, an, an unfriendly place to, to the... To the African. To, okay. To the African. Mm -hmm. would be an unfriendly place, mm -hmm. cold and hostile, Okay, you see. But I'm saying that the African image, the African can't write, uh, this is like a jungle. Mm -hmm. What was happening in the Eurasian stuff? That's what I'm getting at. Well, in terms destruction. Of how the, okay. uh, the Viking behavior, the Viking uh, destruction and the, the vandals and, and all, mm -hmm. all of this kind of thing in terms of people uh, destroying things. The word imagination means what? You say? Well, I mean, I, I've, I've used this uh, meaning of this word actually in conjunction with what uh, might be called sciencing, which was a, a, a system of wording that came actually out of the, the Moorish uh, movement. And I call imagination the image of a nation. Can, can you give me some more on that? Well, it's simply, it's, it's a part of sciencing. Mm -hmm. You know, when we say community, a when, we say, when we say community, mm -hmm. we say community means come unity. That is the sciencing technique that okay. comes out of the, the, Moorish, um, the Moorish movement. So uh, imagination, I said, uh, one could look at imagination, particularly in an Afrocentric sense, as an okay. image of a nation. If we, as African Americans and Africans around the world, reach for Afrocentric awareness. What is the prognosis of our future in terms of your eyes? And what is the prognosis if we don't? Well, the prognosis for our future, if we do, is one in which uh, African people will assume uh, 
their rightful place uh, in world history. Uh, and we will reclaim the place we once had in world history as a mature and independent and autonomous people. If we do not, we will remain uh, vestiges of a declining civilization. We will also remain um, people uh, who are on the periphery uh, of someone else's culture, uh, lost, uh, unable to find ourselves. Uh, our posterity will be further lost, confused, and, uh, and in, in effect, destroyed uh, psychologically, economically, uh, and culturally. Final question. Talk, if you will, about the importance of the mine, the role the mine will play in helping African Americans and Africans around the world becoming free, and the need for African American parents, African parents, to capture the minds of their children at an early age. When the child is three or four years old, the, ch the parents should, uh, haven't already begun, but should then uh, redouble their efforts to capture the mind of African American children. Uh, those children ought to be, uh, in fact, uh, immersed in uh, African culture, with African motifs, with African fabrics, with African rites and rituals. Uh, the uh, Afrocentric rites of passages should be planned for them so that when they are 13, 14, or 15, or 16, that they go through these rites of passages naming their ancestors and the ancestors from the continent uh, being able to um, demonstrate that they are valuable uh, 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 people, parts of the community. Uh, th these things should happen very early because the mind is very important. And the collective conscious will of the people can only uh, bring this about in terms of uh, the efforts of African Americans to be free uh, <coughs> mentally and culturally and, and, and in every way uh, through the will of the people, but the will must be important and is important. And the African American parents have got to just grab those children and immediately begin to uh, indoctrinate them with culture. Because if you don't, someone if, else will. Oh, if you don't, certainly uh, they will be indoctrinated. I mean, that is for sure. I mean, television will do it. Uh, media will. Uh, other media will do it. Uh, it will be done and. And, and we will have, again, a lost generation. Okay. Thank you, sir. It, it is my pleasure. Thank okay. you very much. All right. It won't tell.